Good morning and welcome to worship here at Neils Creek Baptist Church. Hear these words from Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul long in, longs, indeed it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for you, the living God. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we give thanks to you. For you are the one who woke us up this morning. You are the one that provided a roof over our head and heat for our home. You are the one who kept our heart beating, our lungs breathing, the blood flowing through our veins. You provided our breakfast this morning to nourish us and a hot shower to cleanse us. By your hand of blessing, we had a ride to church. And we have this beautiful sanctuary with all kinds of comfortable conveniences that make it more pleasant and desirable to worship you. Oh God, may we never fail to recognize and acknowledge the many abundant blessings that have come from you. May we never cease to magnify you as the one who has given us life and sustained us every moment of every day. Lord, if you took your hand from us, if you turned your back on us, if you removed from us your presence, we could not make it even another day. For Lord, your love is better than life itself. And the psalmist, my God, than to live in the tents of the wicked. So we come into your house, O Lord, with praise on our lips and thanksgiving in our hearts. We declare that this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We know that sorrow may last during the night, but we believe that joy comes in the morning. And we claim your joy today as our strength for living. We pray that you would fill our hearts to overflowing with your great gladness. Lord, we worship you today, for you bestow favor and honor. We pray, Lord, that no, no good thing you would withhold from your people who worship you in spirit and in truth. Come, Holy Spirit, that you may have your way in this house. Come, gracious Father, and sit enthroned on the praises of your people. Come, Lord Jesus, to reveal to us the way, the truth, and the life. As we pray that prayer that you taught, all your disciples to pray saying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Again, welcome to worship uh, here at Neils Creek Baptist Church. Uh, if you're a visitor with us today, we want to say a special word of welcome to you. Uh, I hope when you came in this morning that someone offered you a visitor's cup that looks like this one. Uh, if not, they're available out on the information table uh, to the right uh, as you exit the sanctuary out in the vestibule, uh, feel free to take one of these. Uh, we also have some that are in some tote bags. You can take that as well. You're welcome to any of that. It has a lot of great information about who we are here at Neils Creek Baptist, and we would love to have you be a part of our family of faith. Also, if you're worshiping with us for the very first time this morning, if you would look uh, uh, in the pew rack in front of you where the offering envelopes are kept, uh, right in front of them, you should see a rectangular visitor's card that says welcome on it. And we would love to have you fill out that information on the back of that card and then just drop that in the offering plate when it's passed a little later in the service. We would love to follow up, get to know you a little bit better. If you'll look in your bulletin, there are a number of announcements uh, that I want to go over, a number of inserts. I'm going to try to go over these uh, as quickly as possible. Um, you will see one for the community Thanksgiving dinner that's on Wednesday, November 26th. That's a collaborative effort of the churches in our community to provide a Thanksgiving meal for those that may be homeless or needy. Or uh, We do a number of uh, takeout plates also for those who uh, receive the meals on wheels or may be homebound. So you will see some of the things that you can, that you can check 
uh, right there and, and a place for you to put your name and email and phone number. Uh, Kat Tinsley, our children's minister, is leading that effort. Uh, and we are responsible uh, for doing the stuffing and the gravy and also for having a few drivers that can help deliver some takeout plates that evening. So please be aware of that. We, uh, you can fill that out uh, and remove that bottom portion if you need to. Drop that in the offering plate or turn it into a cat. Also, you'll see uh, the uh, poinsettia order form that we have here. Uh, that's self-explanatory that we always have those beginning for the hanging of the green service that will be uh, on Sunday, November the 30th. Uh, we need these forms no later than Monday the 24th uh, turned into the church office. Uh, the other uh, insert is about the uh, children's home, Baptist children's home Thanksgiving offering. Uh, you'll see an insert uh, describing the ministry of the children's home and then an offering envelope uh, to, to give towards that. We would encourage you to give as the Lord would lead you. Uh, and finally, I want to recognize Lee Adams to talk a little bit about uh, the dinner date night that's coming up this Friday night uh, for our married couples. Okay, so we have, uh, we changed our title a little bit. Now it says dinner and decoupage. Some of you may not know what decoupage is, especially some of the men. So... It's going to be a really fun craft activity where we make a memory box. Um, or Kat had um, a point that it could be any other type of box, like a praise box, where maybe your family, if something cool happens, you write it on a slip of paper and put it in the box. But the idea was kind of a memory box for your family. So you can see that she started the lid with just a few pictures. And these can be, if it's pictures of your family, you can just print it off from the computer. It doesn't have to necessarily be on photo paper. But any picture that would represent your family or your kids or something that you enjoy doing together, then we'll put it on the box. And then we're basically just covering it with layers of glue and Mod Podge. <laughs> yes, we'll have um, different paper if you kind of need to fill in the gaps. So I know if you're a guy... And maybe, like my husband, you're thinking, oh my gosh, <laughs> is this really something I want to do? But there are studies that show getting outside of your comfort zone for date nights improved marital satisfaction. I think I read that somewhere. Um, so, yes, yes. So just try it. It's something fun, and you'll walk away with something cool. You can come home and show your kids. So all you need to do is just bring maybe like 15... 20 pictures or um, not even that much, but just bring some family pictures. We'll have some paper and we're going to provide pizza. And if you don't have a good time, we'll give you your money back. <laughs> Child care is provided by Kat. Yes, please RSVP just so we know how much pizza to buy. And my number is wrong on that little slip of paper, but my email is correct in the, um, like the church email so you can email me if you have any questions Facebook or find me after church but um, it's gonna be really fun and it's for couples young and old you don't have to have young children you can come at any age so is everybody excited nobody looks excited okay <laughs> and I think we also agree that you that it's for couples that are dating too you don't have to be you do not have to be married I think I said that wrong uh, earlier so you can you can be dating so anyway if you plan on coming uh, we need you to RSVP and we need you, uh, if you need child care, to please note that on here. Now, I can't pass this up without saying this. Men, men, if you knew before Lee described what decoupage or decoupage, however you say it, what that is, I want you to come down front at the end so I can pray with you. And then we're going to go deer hunting sometime in the near future <laughs> because you've got a lack of testosterone going on somewhere. Number two, men, men, sometimes you do things as an emotional deposit. Some people call it brownie points. This would be one of those good times to make an emotional deposit because if you're like me, 
every now and then you need to make a withdrawal. And you can't withdraw if you've not made a deposit. So come on to date night, Friday night here at the church. I will be here with my lovely wife. One uh, important announcement that I did want to uh, make sure everyone is aware of because it is not in the bulletin. We apologize for that. But this Friday is our week to do the Buddy Backpacks at 9 o'clock at the Anger Food Pantry uh, downtown. It's right across Raleigh Street from uh, the public library right next to the was car drug. What is it called now? Uh, Walgreens. Okay. So that's, that's the food pantry, 9 o'clock. We will be doing, it's our week to do uh, buddy backpacks. And they are double packing because this is the last one, I think, before the children go on their Thanksgiving break. And so we're going to be doing some extra. So we need as many hands and helpers as we can get uh, Friday morning at 9 o'clock. Uh, so please uh, put that on your calendar. Uh, we do have a special meeting at uh, 5.45 this afternoon for our choir members, our deacons, our church staff, and the personnel committee. Uh, we are going to be having a meet and greet time uh, with the candidate for the director of music position. So if you fall under any of those categories, uh, choir, church staff, deacons, or personnel committee, uh, please be here in the fellowship hall at 5.45 this afternoon. The deacons meeting has been moved to next Sunday, uh, the 23rd at 5 o'clock. Remember that the Brotherhood, uh, they are collecting the uh, items for Thanksgiving baskets. They'll be putting those together next Sunday at 3 o'clock. We have a collection bin here outside of the church office. Uh, have just a few announcements for youth news that I wanted to uh, bring to your attention uh, Carol and Mark could not be here this morning, but they wanted to thank everyone who supported the youth fundraiser and cake auction. They raised uh, $3,400 for youth missions, and so they are very grateful, very appreciative of that. Uh, we do want to thank everyone who has helped uh, provide a shoebox for our, uh, Operation Christmas Child. I'm sure Kat will be uh, mentioning that. We're going to be praying over them at, during the children's uh, sermon. Uh, youth. On Wednesday night or Wednesday afternoon, uh, you will be going to help work at the Campbell Christmas Store. So youth need to be here at the church at 4.15 is when the church bus will be leaving to go to Campbell University. Or you can meet them over there at Carter Gymnasium at 4.45. Uh, bring some money for fast food for dinner and then you'll be coming back here to the church for your regular Bible study time until 8 o'clock. Any other special announcements that we need to be aware of before we look at our prayer list? Yes, I'm aware of that. Thank you, Gary. He was just sharing with me uh, as we move to our prayer list that today is Carrie and Susan Stewart's 46th wedding anniversary. And so uh, we celebrate with them. So congratulations. Carrie asked me if he could have the day off. I said, well, if I had such a pass, I would give it to Susan. <laughs> You'll see our prayer topics listed here at the top of our uh, prayer list. Uh, we, we have a, a lot of names here listed in bold. Forgive me, I'm not going to be able to go over each and every uh, one of those. Uh, we do rejoice that Mr. R.H. is with us today and continue to pray for for your recovery, Mr. R.H., glad you're home from the hospital. John Ennis uh, has had some improvements this week, and so we're very grateful uh, for that and want to pray for continued strengthening uh, for him. Uh, Dan Deaton uh, is, is doing okay following his uh, surgery uh, on his uh, knee, knee replacement. Uh, then I want to add a couple of names to the prayer list. Uh, Mark Blaylock's grandmother, Miss Rena Blaylock, she recently fell and broke her wrist. And then uh, Tracy's grandmother, Judy Stevenson's mother, Miss Clara Barber, she uh, recently fell as well. And so let's remember uh, those two special ladies in our prayers. And then we want to uh, remember Jason Brown. Uh, his grandfather passed away this week, Ralph Oliver, his grandfather who lived in Georgia 
passed away this week. Are there other prayer requests or praise reports that would come before the body of Christ this morning? Yes. Yeah. Good. Wonderful. Wonderful. Good. So glad to hear that, Faith. Yeah. Okay. All right, spell that last name for me. Okay. Yes, Carla. Okay, thank you, Carl. Yes, Anita. Okay. Any other? All right, let's keep these special uh, requests in our prayers and close to our heart this week. At this time, let's stand as we praise the Lord together. Uh, our first hymn of praise is number 18, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Let's stand as we worship the Lord together. Number 64.
605, because I have been given much. Hymn number 605. Good morning. How are you all? Good. Okay, okay. Well, I want you to think too. Some of you all have not been to a lock-in here yet, but when we have a lock-in, we're in the church and we have dinner and we do some stuff and then we just kind of, you know, hang and then it's nighttime. We get ready and we all bunk down and go to sleep. Now, I'm just picturing if... Braden remembers a time when the lights went out in the bus. I'm guessing, right? It's pretty dark, wasn't it? <laughs> and I'm picturing, what if the whole, all the electricity and all of Andrew went out? So it wasn't just we're here in the church and it's pitch black, but there's no street lights, no parking lot lights and stuff like that. And in the middle of all of y'all going, Miss Cat, Miss Cat, you know, squealing, I say, hold on. Okay, now, it doesn't look like much now, right? But if it was pitch black, wouldn't this cut the dark enough that y'all would see? Yes. And you would trust that I had it under control, right? What, pumpkin? We, we turned the light up and shine the light on the, the door. And, the, and then you go to school and, and also you go to church and be nice. That we're going to go to church and be nice. You are right. I am glad to hear that, man. <laughs> The guy is soaking up some stuff, isn't he? I am loving that. Now, so I'm pictured, you know, y'all would go with the one with the light. Well, um, we got somebody who says, I am the light. Not I hold the light. Not I have the light. Not I know where the light switch is. Who says, I am the light? Jesus, God, right. And what I'm thinking about this morning is... You all know where the light, you know who the light is, right? Well, you know what? There are 58 boxes here. <sighs> that have the potential for 58 children to learn who the light is. Does that make you excited? Does it seriously? Do you realize what it means? This is 58 children who have never heard of Jesus dying on the cross for their sins that they're going to get to go to heaven. 
and they're going to hear about it because of these boxes. I'm bonkers. 58 here and there's still 11 out. And so um, bring them all this week if you don't have them in by Wednesday. Uh, try to get them here by Wednesday and I can take them later in the week. But I also want to point out, I think it's interesting that the poinsettias that you all are going to carry for the Hanging of the Greens, that's one of our favorite parts because you just look so adorable. And we're going to put them up here. A poinsettia costs $7. Okay, how many of you all have your poinsettia from last year that you took home after the service? I actually am embarrassed to admit that I do. And it is still growing. It's one of the few things that I have. Okay, so poinsettia lasts how long? A year. Month. Mine lasted a year, but most of them a couple of a weeks. A, a day. Okay, <laughs> depends on your house, doesn't it? Okay, how long do you think a $7 gift paying the shipping for this will last if it goes to a child who meets Jesus? How long will that $7 last? Eternity. Oh, I love when you pull out one of those great words. Yes, it will last an eternity. So I'm not saying don't buy poinsettias because, as I said, we love that part. But as you write your check for poinsettias, if you're so inclined, I would love it if you would include an extra 7 or 14 or 21 because right now we need $406 to ship these. Um, so it would be great, and if you'll make it payable to the church, it'll be tax deductible, and I'll make sure that it gets to go where it's supposed to go. Pastor Chris, will you please come say the prayer, because you know I couldn't get out a word anyway if I wanted. Have you ever huddled together? All right, let me sit on the steps right here where Jody is, okay? If I can get my big behind right here. And I want you guys to come... And I'll huddle around, okay? And I'm going to hold this up, and you just come put a hand, put your hand on this box, okay? Everybody get in real close, okay? All right. There we go. We got everybody in? All right. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this little shoe box and for these 60-some other shoe boxes that will go to children all around the world. We thank you, Lord, that they will receive uh, a gift of love in this box something that will make their Christmas so special. And we pray, Lord, that with it they will receive uh, the knowledge of the greatest gift of all, and that is Jesus Christ given to this world as our Savior. Lord, may this box be a gift of light from Neils Creek Baptist Church to the children of the world. May you use it and bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you pray with me? Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you in, in your house today. Father, we ask for your forgiveness for the times that we don't recognize and fully understand the blessings that you bestow upon us and the times we fail to thank you and praise you for those blessings. As we return a portion of what you have so graciously blessed us with, Father, we pray that you will bless it and that you will use it to advance your kingdom both here and around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
with me for our scripture reading this morning. It comes from the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, in the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel, and we will read verses 41 through verse 50. Hear now the word of the Lord. The Philistine came and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth ready and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his God. The Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the army of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword or spear, For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine drew nearer to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. David put his hand in his bag and took a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with just a sling and a stone, striking down the Philistine and killing him. And there was no sword in David's hand. God bless the reading of Scripture that we might hear and do His Word. You may be seated. I think I may have shared this with some of you at some point, but one of my favorite Bible stories growing up was the story of David and Goliath. I guess like all little boys, this story had a great appeal to me because it had a fight scene, and the good guy wins. And even better was the fact that the good guy who wins was a little guy like me at the time, and so I could, could relate. The story resonated. Little David becomes the hero of God's army when no one else had the courage to fight Goliath. We all love a story where the underdog wins, don't we? But the story of David and Goliath is more than just a story about the good guy winning, more than just a story about the underdog who becomes victorious. It was for the people of Israel, and it is for us today, a very important story about having the courage and faith to face our giants in life. The reality is that we will all have to face giants, or at least some giant situations in this life. But there's one important truth about battling giants that we must first appreciate this morning above and beyond anything else before you can slay a giant before you can even fight a giant you must first stand up and face the giant and that's what no one else in all of God's army wanted to do no one wanted to stand up and face Goliath no matter how much he taunted no matter how badly he talked about the Lord their God there was no way they were going to have victory No way they could even begin to fight if they were too scared to even face the giant. Sometimes our giants in life are something like a medical condition, cancer. Sometimes our giant in life is a mounting debt. We wonder how we'll ever get out from under it. Sometimes our giant in life is an addiction. And try as we might, we just can't shake it. Sometimes our giant is depression. We know that we shouldn't feel that way, but again, we can't shake it. Sometimes our giant is emotional abuse or heartbreak or the fear of dying or a tragedy like child abuse. In all of these situations and in so many more giants in life, it's so easy to want to run and hide. It's much easier to occupy ourselves with other things so that we don't have to face these seemingly insurmountable situations. It's easier to face the other things in life and keep this 
giant looming thing from staring us in the face. But no matter how difficult or intimidating or frightening it might be, the only way to slay a giant is to first stand up and have the courage to face it. And I would propose to you this morning that David was able to face Goliath for three reasons. Number one, David had the right attitude, a humble servant attitude. Number two, David knew who he was. And third and finally, David knew who God was in his situation. So the first key to slaying our, your, our giant is having the right attitude about the situation. You know, your attitude is directly tied to your faith in what God can do about your giant. Therefore, your attitude often determines your actions. The Bible says that from a young age, David displayed a servant-like attitude. And we know this because David was a shepherd boy. We read in the previous chapter, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, uh, that the prophet Samuel is called by God to go to the house of Jesse and to anoint the next king for Israel. And so Samuel goes to Jesse's house just like the Lord has instructed him. And there Jesse presented to Samuel seven of his sons. And you remember that Samuel was ready to uh, immediately anoint the oldest son assuming that surely he would be the king God has chosen. But God stopped him, and he said, No, Samuel, he's not the one. And again and again, for all seven of those sons, Samuel was ready to anoint each one of them, thinking that they were surely the one chosen by the hand of God, but each time, God stopped Samuel. And finally, God speaks to Samuel in that moment, saying, Samuel, do not look at their appearance. Don't look at their height. Don't look at their, their muscle build or stature. For the Lord does not see those things as men see them. The Lord does not look on the outward appearance. But the Lord looks on the heart, on the character, on what is on the inside. And God could see that the youngest of Samuel's eight sons, the shepherd boy out in the field, the one whom Jesse did not even think important enough or worthy enough or ready enough to present before Samuel, that was the one whose heart was in the right place. He was the one God had chosen to be the next king for Israel. And so Samuel goes out to the pasture and he anoints David at such a young age for his assignment and his future destiny as heir to the throne of Israel. Like the prophet Samuel, you and I ought to start looking on the hearts of our young people in this church and listening for the voice of God and calling out their divine gifts and encouraging in them their divine destiny in the Lord. It makes a difference. It makes a difference. Well, you would think that after Samuel anoints David with such a gesture as this, that it might go to David's head. But we read in chapter 17 that little David has not changed one bit even after his anointing. He has watched his older brothers go off to war to fight for the nation of Israel while he is stuck at home caring for the sheep. You see, being a shepherd was not glorious work. It demanded a servant attitude. Being a shepherd was messy and exhausting and hard labor. It took a humble person to be a good shepherd. But David was willing to handle those smelly sheep. He was willing to sleep out in the pasture with them at night in order to protect them. He would drive them to green pastures when they were hard-headed and didn't want to move. He would lead them to clean water. He would care for the wounded animals. He would help nurse the little lambs. David had a servant heart as he cared for the sheep of his father. Even when his brothers were bigger and stronger and probably more well able, David never complained that he was the one left alone to care for the sheep. He could have complained, he could have had a negative attitude, he could have been jealous of what his brothers had, but David understood that as messy as it was, being a shepherd was an important task that needed doing, especially in a time of war. And he did it with excellence. He didn't complain, 
He didn't bemoan his lot in life. He did not curse the sheep. Instead, he served day after day doing the lowly work on the family farm in Bethlehem that none of his other brothers were willing to help him do, even after he had been anointed and chosen to be the next king of that country. Having the right attitude is so important when it comes to facing our giants in life. Jesus said, the greatest among you will be like the servant. He later told a parable in where he said, the one who is faithful with a little bit can be trusted with a lot. It was because David had been faithful in the pasture that God could use him to do spectacular things on the battlefield. It was because David had the right attitude when he was doing a thankless job all by himself on the farm that God could use him to win a, the heart of a nation through a great victory on the battlefield. Facing our giants begins when you and I have the right attitude, when we get our heart right with God. The second key to slaying your giant is knowing who you are. As we continue to follow the life of David in 1 Samuel 17, his father Jesse asked if David would be willing to go to the army camp there in the valley of Elah to take his brothers some grain and some bread and some cheese. And I'm sure that David jumped at this opportunity to be able to see something other than the sheep and the pasture for just a few days. And it was there on the battlefield in the camp of the army of Israel that David first hears Goliath march out and taunt the armies of Israel and defile the name of the Lord their God. And so David begins to ask who this man is and why no one will stand up to him. And why uh, anyone should be allowed to talk about their God in such a fashion. The soldiers explained to him that Goliath is uh, a beast of a man. That he is bloodthirsty. That he is a warrior who seeks to kill and destroy anything in his path. Goliath had proposed uh, a solution for the war. He said, instead of having many, many casualties, many lives lost in hand-to-hand -hand combat, why don't uh, you send one warrior from the army of Israel to come out and face me on the battlefield? And we'll have a duel, one-on-one, -on -one, and we will battle to the death, and whoever is victorious, that will be the winning side, the winning country. One battle, one round, will win the entire war. And we'll spare so many lives. It'll be a quick way to settle the fight. It won't be drawn out and prolonged. Sounded like a great plan. The only problem was even under the best conditions, it was a 50-50 chance on the fate of your nation. And facing a man like Goliath, no one in all of Israel was found that wanted to battle him because the odds were so stacked in his favor, and in the favor of the Philistines. No one wanted to face the giant. No one except the little shepherd boy from Bethlehem. And so David sends word to Saul that he would go. He would fight Goliath. And in a comedy of sorts, Saul agrees that he will send this young boy, the youngest of his brothers, far younger than any of the other trained soldiers in the army of Israel to fight on behalf of his nation. Saul is willing to bet the reputation of his army and the fate of his country on a young teenage boy who has absolutely no training as a soldier. What little King Saul did have to offer to David is the very best of his fighting armor. And we read in chapter 17 that Saul puts a bronze helmet on his head and he puts the strongest coat of mail on him and the king straps his sword on David's side. And the funny thing is, is that David can barely move, much less attempt to fight with all of this armor on. He waddles around like a duck. He, he stumbles like he is drunk because the armor's too big. It's too cumbersome. It's too heavy. It does not fit him, and he was not used to it. He was not strong enough nor experienced enough for any of that to do him any good. Saul was trying to force David to be someone who he wasn't. And because David knew himself and was comfortable and confident in who he was, he knew this would never work. 
common sense would say you don't go into a battle with a giant without some protection and some armor. But David knew that was not him. That wasn't who he was. And so he tells Saul in verses 39 and 40, he says, I cannot walk in these. I cannot walk in these. And so David took them off. And he took his staff in his hand, and he chose five smooth stones from the creek, and he put them in his shepherd's bag, in his pouch, with his sling in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. What a powerful example of being who you are, who God has called you to be, and rejecting any attempt for someone to try and make you into something you're not. David was comfortable and confident in being a shepherd. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't going to face this giant by trying to pretend to be someone he wasn't. He knew that God could not bless him pretending to be a soldier. You remember that from last week? God cannot bless who we pretend to be. God couldn't bless Jacob pretending to be Esau. He cannot bless David pretending to be a soldier. And he surely cannot bless you or me if we pretend to be something or someone who we really are not. When we face giants in life, there will always be those like Saul who try to offer us some help. And sometimes they mean well. And sometimes they don't mean well. But oftentimes those people will come to us when we are about to face our giant and they'll try to convince us that we need to do certain things or act a certain way. And we know that's not really who we are. Those people will try to give us a new way of being us, a new identity if we'll let them. And they'll tell us that we can face our giant if we'll just be like everyone else. If we'll just put on the armor and look like all the rest of the soldiers and do the things that they do, and it's very hard to say, no, I can't do that. I've got to be myself. But David did that. He refused to wear the king's armor. And you and I should refuse to put on anything that anyone else offers us if it doesn't come from God, especially when we're about to face a giant. You see, David knew who he was. David was a young man. He was agile. He was quick. He was fast on his feet. When Goliath came to him, the text says that David ran out to meet him. You see, Goliath was a big man. He was brawny. He was huge. But that also meant that in his bulk, he was slow. He didn't move quickly. He was strength and muscle. But he was also so big that... A small guy like David who was quick and agile and could confuse him in his movements could also prevail against him. David understood that the qualities God had naturally given him were actually the very things that would make him the perfect fighter to face Goliath. He didn't need the armor. He didn't need the king's sword. All he needed was the very tools that God had equipped him with as a shepherd. All of those years watching the sheep, God was going to use the servant of the sheep to be a mighty soldier in battle. What looked like uh, thankless, dirty, smelly work that nobody else wanted to do was actually what God used to prepare David for this very moment to be victorious in battle over Goliath. That's why we should never be ashamed of who we are or where we've come from. Because those years that seemed like they were wasted or good for nothing, that might just be what God is using to prepare you for your destiny. We cannot face our giants pretending to be someone who we're not. Know who you are. Be unashamed of who you are. Be yourself in all of life's situations. Know your strengths, your weaknesses, your identity, and your gift. Don't let anyone ever try to put something on you, especially something big and heavy that God never intended you to wear or to walk in. You better tell them real quick like David, I cannot walk in this. I cannot walk in this. Be yourself. Third and finally, we must know by faith who God is. 
when it's time to face our giants. You see, David not only knew who he was, but most importantly, he knew who he had faith in. He had faith in his God. And he tells King Saul that his faith isn't just some nice-sounding religious sentiment. David knew who God was in his life. He had first-hand experience of the power of God and what faith in God could do. You see, David tells King Saul in chapter 17 that he didn't need the armor. He didn't need the king's sword. He didn't need any weapons that the government could provide. He didn't need the king's protection or the, the, the instruments of human warfare. David told the king, that as he attended the sheep of Jesse's flock, that many times there had come a wild animal to attack the sheep in the pasture, a lion or a bear. And even so brave was this little shepherd boy that he would rescue even a little lamb out of the mouth of a bloodthirsty lion or bear with nothing but his bare hands. And so David concludes in 1 Samuel 17, 37, Look at it. He says, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will also save me from this Philistine. David knew if God had done it for him before, he could surely do it for him again. This was not the first time that David had faced insurmountable odds. But if by the power of God he could wrestle a bear or a lion and subdue it with his bare hands in order to save even one sheep in the flock of Jesse, surely by the power of God he could subdue a giant named Goliath and rescue the sheep of God's pasture, the people of Israel. David went up against Goliath with the greatest weapon of all, faith, faith in God. He boldly told Goliath in verse 45, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I'm not afraid because I come in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the army of Israel. You see, you overcome big obstacles. You defeat your giants in life only by remembering the mighty God you serve. And if this mighty God could help a young teenager defeat a mammoth of a man on the battlefield, where the fate of an entire nation hung in the balance, I know he can help you and me whenever we face our giants. I came to tell someone this morning that it's time to start declaring to your enemy. It's time to start speaking to your giant about the God you serve. It's time to start looking that thing that you're afraid of right square in the face and tell it that your courage comes in the name of the Lord. It's time to stand up in faith and watch God fight for you. And some of you may say, Pastor Chris, you don't know my situation. You don't know what I'm facing. How do you know that God will fight for me? Well, God told me to tell you this morning that David came to the battle not knowing what he was going to have to face. But God already put the sling in his pouch. David was just delivering some bread to his brothers, but God had already prepared him with the weapon of his warfare before he even got there and knew who he was going to have to fight. And when it came time to fight, God gave him what he needed, five smooth stones in the riverbed so that he could use what God had already placed in his pouch. I came to tell somebody today, God's already given you what you need to fight before you even face the giant. He's already given it. God's already put the slingshot in your sack. He's already got your five smooth stones waiting when you get there. My God's got preparatory provision on the front end and additional ammunition when you get there. That's a good place to say amen. Y'all got to talk to me, church. God gave him five smooth stones, but how many did he have to use? One. One, my God's got more than enough to overcome the giant in your life if you'll have the faith to face it and let God fight the battle for you. Verse 50 tells us that David won the battle with no sword in his hands. You see, you don't need a sword in your hand when you've got faith in your heart. And I don't know what your giant looks like this morning, but I know who my God is. I don't know how big, how scary, how intimidating it may seem to face that thing in your life, but I do know this. 
with the right attitude, if you know who you are and you'll be yourself, and most importantly, if you know God and His power, if you'll be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, He will fight your battle and there's no giant too big for our God. The invitation this morning is to come to the altar. If you need an attitude adjustment, the Holy Spirit can help you with that this morning. Give you the right attitude about your situation. Maybe you've been pretending to be someone you're not for far too long. And you've been walking in all kinds of things that you were not meant to walk in. And you've been so busy carrying the weight of everyone else's expectations, trying to please them, that you've forgotten who you really are and who God made you to be. Maybe you need to come to the altar this morning and let the Holy Spirit put you in touch with your star player, with the champion inside of you with the person who God created you and destined you to be. I come to declare to someone this morning that God has destined you to be a victor. So stop walking around in the armor of a victim. Or maybe this morning you need to come pray for faith. More faith to face the giant and declare by faith that God will fight this thing for you, that he'll work it out for your good, that he will bring you through this better off than you were before, that if he fought for you in the past and he was there for you in those situations in life in the past, he will be there in your present, that Jesus has already won the victory. If you'll come to the altar this morning with your heart open to God, I know that he'll meet you here. I know that his presence and his power will be here at the altar, if you will open yourself to the Spirit of God. He's an on-time God, and He'll be there just when we need Him most. So let's stand as we respond to God, singing together hymn number 65, Just When I Need Him Most.
seated for just a second. I want to introduce to you uh, someone that God has brought into the life of our church. Most of you have already uh, know, met him and, and got to uh, know just a little bit of his testimony. This is William Barber, Jr., and uh, he started worshiping with us several weeks ago. And uh, sometimes God just allows your path to cross at just the right time, uh, and you see God working in it. And I think uh, that has been true for William and for our church as well because uh, he's needed us and we needed him uh, at this time. And uh, many of you know a little bit about what William has been through recently. Uh, he was uh, here with us in revival. He felt God leading him to join our church. And, and then the very next day, he had an accident working on his Jeep where the radiator exploded and he had uh, some pretty severe burns on his body. Uh, but he went to Chapel Hill to the burn center and within two weeks, he had had skin graft and was home and released from the hospital. And God is healing him more and more every day. And uh, I'll have to say, Will, uh, I have an opportunity to walk with a lot of people as they go through uh, health crisis and, and through hospital situations. And I don't know, we just talked about David's attitude. I don't know that I've met anyone that's ever had a better attitude about it and understood that even during a great time of personal trial and, and physical pain, that it was still an opportunity uh, for him to share his faith and witness. And I think Will will tell you that what got him through each one of those days, uh, having that skin worked on and everything, was being able to share with people about his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, I'm excited that he stands before us today uh, to want to join uh, this family of faith. And uh, Will, have you you've been baptized before, right? I thought so. And so he comes to transfer his membership here to be a part of the body of Christ here at Neal's Creek. And if you would welcome him, would you just say amen? amen. And that sounded like everybody will. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to ask you just to stand up here and uh, just be here for people to come come by and greet you and uh, tell you how much you mean to us. He, will has uh, four uh, beautiful children. that, that They're here with him every other uh, weekend and worship with him, a daughter and three sons. And so I'm sure you'll get an opportunity to meet them if you haven't already. And uh, we, just, we just welcome you. We know that God's going to use you and continue to do great things here in the life of our church. Let's stand together for our benediction. Lord, we thank you today that we leave this place encouraged. That, Lord, we're ready for whatever we're going to face this week. Lord, we don't know what giants might be in our path. We don't know if we're going to have to fight some battles. Or, Lord, if our assignment might be just to deliver some bread and help somebody in need. But whatever it is, we know, Lord, you've already prepared us for it if we'll trust in you, if we'll walk with you. And so, Lord, let us leave the house of God with great rejoicing. Let us leave this place with gladness in our heart that we might share with someone else, that we might be salt and light to this world. In Jesus' name, amen.